arises about biodiversity, and I, in the morning I mentioned, yeah, we have the 1% are all the vertebrate animals, are well represented in this building. The 99% other percent is not so well represented, maybe. And as a part of that, in the Netherlands, about 23% of the species are fungi. And in fact, uh, species are one thing, but of course, a species on your own, uh, independent of how well you have showered or washed yourself this morning, you're an whole ecosystem, and that's why you're healthy. So species on their, on, their, on their own are nothing. It's really about networks, and nature is the ultimate networker, I think. And somebody who knows a lot about that is our next speaker, Toby Kiers, who is professor of evolutionary biology at, uh, at the Free University of Amsterdam. Um, and Toby has worked a lot on fungal networks, has also started, how crazy can you be, the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks, very clever, and you'll tell all about uh, these kind of things. So I'm very pleased that you're here, uh, and um, please take the floor. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> it's so bright. Okay, yeah, so, I want to say two things about the talk today, two really important take-home messages. And so this morning you heard about exploration in space, right? But I would wager that there's just as much to learn below our feet, and we're calling those people underground astronauts. We're getting a little bit less funding than space people, but there's still so much to discover. And I think the second take-home message of today is that we have to, we have to remember that Biodiversity is more than cataloging species, right? And I think that's what this event has taught us today. And as we do that, one of the key things in, I think, understanding biodiversity is understanding the strategies that underlie this biodiversity. And so that's what I want to focus on a bit today is trying to understand those strategies in fungi. Okay, so is there a way to get it a little bit darker? The, the videos are much more dramatic if it's dark, and there's no need to see me quite so much, but maybe it's for the, for the video. But um, what you're looking at right now is a video that we have been taking, a series of videos of living fungal networks. And we've been, um, we've been taking these videos in collaboration with AMOF, the Biophysics Institute in Amsterdam, and we've been seeing things that we never imagined that we could see before. So this is a living arbuscular mycorrhizal network, and this network um, is moving resources. And what I want you to understand is that these strategies, this movement, is under fungal control. Right? And so this is in real time, this is not sped up. If we could see what's happening under the ground, this is what you would see. And you see how complex it is. It moves one direction, it moves another, it changes directions. And understanding these strategies is really paramount for climate change, because a lot of the carbon that's in our atmosphere is going through plants and then being fed to these networks. And so that's what we're trying to do in our group, is understand this language of flows, understand this fungal behavior, and understand how we can use this information as we face all of these changes in our climate. Now, what you're, these, are, these are symbiotic fungal networks. So what they do is they're exchanging carbon that they get from root systems for fungi, for, for, uh, for phosphorus that the fungi are foraging for in the soil. Now, there's billions of these hyphae under an acre of forest. And there's tens of billions of these hyphae under an acre of grassland. So they are incredibly, incredibly vast. So anywhere between 30 and 50% of the living biomass of these soils is these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Now, I think a lot of people don't understand just how much this leads to intense carbon stocks underground. So this is a paper that was in Science in 2019, and it just gives a snapshot of what you're looking at in terms of carbon stocks of tropical rainforests versus tundra underground. So understanding the underground is really paramount to our future. Now here's another tool that we're developing in our lab that allows us to actually make these X-ray 3D scans of the interactions between fungal networks and roots. Now this is really important for all different kinds of domains because when you think about it, it's up to about 80% of the phosphorus 
in plants is provided by these fungal networks. Now that's exciting because what it means is that the, the DNA that actually makes up our own our, our own DNA, human DNA, is mostly made out of phosphorus that first pass through a fungal network. So what we're trying to do is understand the strategies of these fungal networks, right? Our lab is interested in trying to track resource exchange between plants and fungi, trying to quantify how much of that resources are exchanged, and then predict, right? Predict how these underground flows are going to respond to climate change. And in that sort of looking forward, we're at this really interesting part of biological, I'd say, history. Where we're moving from a very old sort of paradigm of microbial behavior as sort of standalone asocial organisms to microbes as social actors, right? Performing very complex behaviors. And this is how we're approaching the study of fungal networks. So we're really interested in trying to understand how information across these fungal networks, how it's processed and how it's shared, and how that leads to different strategies across different types of fungal networks. Now, when you think about it, symbiotic fungal networks, they have to do a few different things. And these things are very complicated. So that's why it makes it a really interesting model organism to study. So first, it has to create an infrastructure, right? It has to create an infrastructure to actually go out in the soil and collect resources. Next, it has to evaluate where you would actually transport those resources for trade. And next, it has to collect payment for those resources to get a good price. So again, these are all the types of strategies that we are focused on understanding. Now, the problem is that we've been very focused on looking at fungal networks in a laboratory setting. And what that means is that we don't really understand the context of trade, right? Trade strategies are predicted to shift even if there's just a small change in, let's say, available resources in the soil, or you know, how fast a plant may be growing, how much, how much uh, photosynthesis is happening above ground. And bringing up that type of complexity is, is very difficult, right? We don't understand the chemical, the physical, the environmental stimuli that's actually mediating these trade strategies. And so this is my first meme I've ever done in my life. But I, I, I like it because it's really a bit about a poker game, right? So this is what we're trying to understand is this trade for, for carbon to phosphorus. And you've got the plant root on one side and the fungal network on the other. And they've been doing this for 450 million, I get shivers thinking, 450 million years. How could we not be studying the strategies that have evolved, right? And so this is, this is me in the corner. <laughs> just trying to watch. And I would argue that a lot of what's been happening is in the dark, right? In these systems, it's totally underground. So it's very, very hard to understand and track these trade strategies. So what we've been trying to do in my group is actually try to visualize trade. And it's, it sounds like a big task, and it is, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But one of the tools that we've been using um, are these in vitro root organ cultures, right? So this is what you're looking at right now. And you're looking at a plant root that has no photosynthetic top, right? This plant root is growing on an agar medium. It gets its carbon from the media and then it converts the carbon into a form that it can feed the fungal network. So what's important about, to know about these networks is that they're called obligate biotrophs, right? It's a big word, but basically it just means that they, they rely on their host plant for all of their carbon, their sugars and their fats. And so we grow it in the, syst in the lab, in this system, where the fungal network is in this very pristine environment, but it also allows us to have an extraordinary amount of ability to manipulate the situation. And the next sort of technique that we have been working with is, um, is a technology called quantum dots. Now, quantum dots are these semiconducting nanoparticles, and they, they fluoresce in very pure, bright colors when they're exposed to a UV source. And we can tag those quantum dots onto resources like apatite, which is a rock form of phosphate. And what this allows us to do is actually then study how resources are moved across the network. Because you can use different colors. 
So right now we've got about three colors that we can work with, and this allows us to sort of change, for example, we can add the different colors at different times, or we can add the colors at different places in space. And then we can first, for the first time, you know, sitting at that poker table, kind of understand the strategies that these fungal networks um, exhibit. And over the years, we found some very interesting strategies, right? And you have to remember, these are all strategies that have existed, right, without cognition, all in the absence of cognition. So we found that fungi are very good at discriminating among plant roots, right? They can tell a plant that's giving them lots of carbon versus one that's giving them very few carbon. We also know that, um, that when you reward fungi with carbon, this triggers more cooperation. So in this case, it, it provides more nitrogen. The fungus ends up giving more nitrogen to the host root. One of the sort of the most interesting ideas is this, this, this hypothesis that fungi can actually restrict the autonomy of root systems. So what that means is that the fungi can get into a root system and actually downregulate the ability of the plant's own nutrient transporters to take up resources from the environment. So basically hijacking the plant's own nutrient uptake system. But that works perfectly for the fungi because then they're, they're getting plenty of carbon and the plant becomes even more dependent on the fungi. Fungi can move resources to increase their value. Using the quantum dot method, we had, all, we had this setup where we were creating hot, um, rich patches and poor patches, and then studying how the fungi was taking up those resources and moving them across the network to places where plant demand was higher and they could get a higher price. And lastly, I think this is one of my favorite ones, and I've been you know, studying this one for a couple years now, this idea that the fungi can actually hoard resources. And this is a brilliant, hoarding is a brilliant evolutionary strategy, right, by any, by any organism. This idea that fungi can take up resources into their network, store it until resource levels outside the network become quite low, and then exchange it. These are important because they can help us better collaborate with fungi in the future. So what do I mean? Well, we had a paper recently looking at, for example, how you can play with the relatedness of fungal networks and how that can change the strategies of the fungi and how much resources they give to the host root. So this is just a very simple experiment where we tried to make these uh, fungal networks that varied in how related they were. So imagine you had two root systems and then you had a connecting, joining fungal network in a center compartment. And then within that compartment, we, we played around with, with which fungal network was me meeting with other fungal networks. What we found was that when they were not related, the fungi tended to put much more energy into this extra radical growth. They were growing bigger networks when they were with non-relatives, right? But that did not necessarily increase the benefit to the host plant. So again, what you're looking at here on the y-axis is, is, is quantum dots in the focal root. So that's, again, tracking these nanoparticles. And you can see that actually the, the network, when it was with its relatives, that's when you found a higher amount of phosphorus being transferred to this fungal network. And now what we're trying to do is understand those strategies. So in a second, what you'll see is this imaging robot that we've started to design to actually peer into the architecture of these networks to understand how changes in topology are related to the amount of nutrients these fungi exchange. So again, this is just a quick snapshot of what fungal uh, networks look like when they're with relatives or non-relatives. But again, it gives us this sort of peek into strategies and how, for example, in agriculture, we might harness these fungal networks. Either do we want them to store more carbon and grow bigger networks, or, or are we more interested in the ways that they've moved the nutrients to the host plant? We can play around, let's say, with the levels of relatedness in these networks. More broadly, Again and again, this is what we keep finding, is this idea that fungi, they use their networks to redistribute resources in a way that increase their returns from hosts. Now, this is really important because I think in the popular literature, there's this, there's this understanding that, I don't know, fungi sort of come across as an accessory to plant roots, right? And that the plants are using the fungi to communicate or do what they do. But actually, we are taking a totally radical view on this and 
trying to understand all of these strategies from a strictly fungal point of view. What do the fungi get out of connecting different plant roots? What do they get across? What do they, how do they benefit from moving these allochemicals that plants are exchanging underground? So again, really taking a totally different viewpoint on the system and really making a, a, a fungal first um, vantage point. And then you start to see them in a totally different way, right? You see these architectures that have to do all of these different tasks, all of these different traits. And so what we're doing is actually trying to make sense of those architectures and ask, are they adaptive under different, under different contexts? How do, they, how, do they, how do they use their networks to move resources and connect plans? And so, together with Loreto Oretes Galvez, we have been building this imaging robot that is sort of changing the way that we see fungal topology, because what it's able to do is take these really high-resolution images about every four hours. And so what you can do is you can set up different treatments for these fungi and see how they react to it. So, for example, if you grow a host under high amounts of carbon, how does that change how the fungal network grows? What if you expose the fungal network to these patches of, of nutrients? How does that change how it moves across the landscape? And so what we do then is extract the network and then start to follow it over time, stitch all of these images together to actually follow a network over time and start to understand the kind of rules that govern how a network moves across space and time. And not only that, but because we're working with biophysicists, they want to follow every single node, right? It's not good enough just to take a picture of the fungal network. They want to follow every single node in space and see how that changes. And actually, this is really getting at this underlying behavior again, right? This is this behavior of how fungi are moving across the landscape and, and, and how they react to different challenges. And what we've been learning, so this is, this is work that is just coming out uh, from a, a PhD student, really exciting work, where he's sort of taking a step back and using these terabytes of data that we've been collecting on fungal networks and saying, okay, well, are, are there any sort of, um, are there any bigger take-home messages about how the fungi explore space? And what we're finding is that they're different from bacteria, right? And that's, that's like a big statement for mycologists, right? And it's exciting because a lot of people think microbes are microbes, right? Fungi are different. And not only are fungi different, but symbiotic fungi are different. They're different than free-living fungi. They seem to follow different rules. And so what we've been looking is saying, can we, can we quantify the topology of these networks over time? Is there a trade-off between the way they extract resources and how they explore space? And what we found is that it doesn't follow this exponential carrying capacity that you see with bacteria, where they grow to a certain level and then all of the resources um, are, are, are extracted and then they move away from that resource. Instead, we see something different. So this is a graph he made of something called a traveling wave dynamic. Now, this is quite interesting. So what it means when a fungi follows a traveling wave dynamic is that as the front of the fungi moves forward, it does not grow behind it to a higher density. right? So it's not exploring every pixel of space. Rather, it's building much more of an infrastructure and not going back and growing exponentially. So again, this is what you're looking at in the red is the, is the tip density, and in the blue is the density of the fungal network behind the growing tip. OK, so what that means, to, to, to sort of summarize what a traveling wave and why that's exciting, is that it means that the fungi are limiting their density behind where they travel. And so what they're doing is they seem to be prioritizing exploration for new trade sites. So whether that's new routes, that's you know, let, yet to be determined. We're about to start a whole new experiment where we're going to add different root systems into this, into this setup. But I think what's probably most interesting about this strategy is it's moving out of this extraction of resource strategy. And rather, it has some sense of its limits. 
And it's using this network to build a topology that can move resources between hubs rather than concentrating on extracting resources from a specific place in space and time. Then we start to zoom in, right? And we really want to understand then, if you have understand this topology of a fungal network, what does it look like inside that fungal network? And we see, we're starting to see speeds that reach really high levels, hundreds of microns per second at the, as, this, as this traveling wave starts to form. Now this is one of the sort of the more dynamic flows inside a fungal network. But we also see very simple flows of bi-directionality. And of course, this really makes sense, right? The fungi, they have to move, be moving carbon in one direction and phosphorus in the other. But exactly how they do that is still completely unknown to scientists. So somehow, they are separating these resource streams without any sort of barrier, no physical barrier that breaks it down. So imagine, it's sort of like you're having traffic, but like not having any lanes where you're going one way or the other, but just self-organizing these waves of resources. So again, you can imagine that, yeah, there are lots of disciplines are quite interested in this question of how they're actually able to do this. And so what we're doing is now tracking individual particles that are inside these fungal networks and trying to understand how they're using these flows to move the resources in a way that not only allow them to extract the resources and trade it with the root, but get a fair price in the sense that they are essentially calculating across the entire network where to move the resources. So again, really zooming in and trying to say what's happening with individual particles inside this network. And you can do that in many different ways. This is beautiful. You can start extracting different velocities of different particles. And now, really, the frontier, I would say, is trying to label those individual particles. Right now, we're just calling them cellular contents, right? It's so complex inside these networks, it's very hard to sort of separate out all of the different cellular components. So that's sort of the next step. But what we're really trying to do here is start to establish the link between this fungal behavior how fast they're moving the carbon, and this idea of drawing carbon down into the atmosphere and putting it into the soil. OK, so why does it matter? It matters because it's like we are really, we're really worried about the soils. And that's why we want to understand this fungal behavior, right? So you know, this, this is a UN statistic. It's a bit alarmist. I'm sure there's time. But 2050 is really soon, right? And it's hard to say, OK, what exactly does it mean to be you know, a, a degraded soil? Oh, it, the font messed up. Um, but it's soon, right? A lot of the soil is disappearing, and it's disappearing very soon. So I think. What we're worried about and why we started this NGO of SPUN is that this destruction that's happening underground has largely been undocumented until now. So imagine, you know, on the one hand, in the lab, we're studying these really intricate, intricate strategies and how different species have evolved different strategies and how they work with relatives. And at the other time, there's just, there's just fire and there's plowing and there's nutrients. <laughs> it's, 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 it couldn't be more separate worlds, right? On the one hand, academia is like we're making huge progress and finally understanding the behavior. And on the other hand, the world is moving fast and these networks are getting destroyed. So we founded SPUN um, to start to map, protect, and harness these fungal networks. And I think the mapping part really, really is what is exciting about working with Arise in the future is that we want to map these biodiversity hotspots. We want to know where they are. We want to know what species are there. And we want to understand what sort of ecosystem functions are associated with these biodiversity hotspots. And I think this is kind of a moment, right, where we have this chance to overturn our above ground bias, right? I mean, for decades, we've been focused, centuries, everything is about above ground climate solutions, above ground conservation strategies. All the agendas are about what we see above ground, but they fail to recognize what's happening below ground. And so this is one of the maps that we've been working with as science, scientists at SPUN is to explore these under, 
underexplored regions. Try to identify them, right? Where do we need to have our priorities? Where do we need to explore first? Where is the Amazon of the underground? And how do we find it and how do we protect it? So if you see, there's one really, and maybe you can't see it here, bright spot down in, um, in Chile. And uh, what's exciting is that next week we're going on our first underground expedition uh, to Chile where we're working to ground truth the predictions of our, of our global biodiversity maps. Right? So scientists have been working together to sort of use these algorithms based on the data that we do have to make predictions about where we think the biodiversity hotspots are. But we need to ground truth the data, right? We need to go out there and we need to figure out what species are actually there. So working with Justin Stewart, who's here in the audience, is a PhD student who's, who's leading this ground truthing uh, predictions, we're going to go to some hotspots in Chile and start measuring fungal biodiversity of these networks. And I think what's interesting about this figure is you see blue and red dots because we're scientists, we have to have a control, right? So we're not just going to the biodiversity hotspots. We also have to go to the biodiversity cold spots. And who knows what we'll find in the cold spots, right? But that's, that's including you know, near roadways or in agricultural fields or in managed landscapes. So again, trying to get these, not only ground truth of predictions, but just tr yeah, start feeding into this better global map of what's underground. This is important because it will allow us to make predictions in the future. So this is just a prediction of one of the species of arbuscular mycorrhizae under a climate scenario of business as usual. And this is how the distribution is predicted to change within the next 50 years. So it's pretty dramatic. You can make these kinds of distribution maps for all kinds of species, but people aren't really doing it for fungi. And they're not doing it because they don't have enough of the data that we need to be able to make accurate predictions. But given how important they are, 30 to 50% right, of the living biomass are these fungal networks. So again, it's advocating for getting out there and measuring. So, um, we are also developing this underground explorers program. And that's really exciting, because what we want to do is get many, much more citizens and the public and activists involved in this process. So what we're doing is, is developing a program called Support a Myconaut. So it's really exciting that you guys heard about uh, <laughs> our uh, astronaut this morning. Um, but these are people that you know, are, are interested in fungal biodiversity and are interested in going out and sampling in their own yards and helping us build a bigger, clearer global picture of these fungal networks. And just some milestones that we hope you know, for in the coming time is that in the next 18 months, we hope to collect about 10,000 samples. Um, and in about, it, it will, that'll be in the next uh, 18 months. We want to develop the first red list right, for fungi. You know, which ones are we most worried about, um, and maybe not within the first 18 months, but a big goal of ours is to develop the first fungal conservation easement, right, so that we could have land conserved for something other than plants or animals or the things that you see above ground, but a conservation priority for something you see, you don't see below ground. So that's another thing that we're working towards. Um, and I just want to say thank you. These are all of the amazing team that has put all of these slides together and all of the data. And I think that's the last slide. Yeah, there's our, there's our website. And uh, I think that's it. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, did you think? Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. We have time for oh, a few questions. questions. Yes, yes, then you can stay there. <laughs> Any questions to Toby? One, and then I'll go there. They come first. Uh, thanks for your awesome talk. Uh, do you know, if, do different uh, species of fungi have different rules? Like are, are some traders and other uh, um, communicators, for example? Yeah, so it's so good. So there's one, there's one you know, it's, the species concept is very hard in fungi. It's hard in anything, but it's particularly hard in fungi. But there's one species, as we call it, um, aggregatum, rhizophagus aggregatum, that um, some of the more beautiful images, it makes this kind of, yeah, crinkly type network. And it is so good at hoarding resources, much, much better than the others, right? So it'll grow into a space and it'll collect resources and then it'll just, it just hoards them, right? And it depends on who it's partnered with, whether that strategy works or not. 
So that's what's cool is that you can, you can do manipulative experiments where you add different numbers of species, for example, and see how strategies change. The problem with these kinds of experiments is that you, at the end, we still don't have the genetic tools. This is a really complicated fungi in terms of its, its, um, its genome. So we don't really have the good tools to know exactly when you just make a big mess of them, who is doing what, right? That's the problem with studying strategies in, in, these, in these complex communities. You can quantify how much of one species is there, but you can't really tell what species is doing what. So all we can say are strategies are changing, and there's definitely species that show totally different traits than others. Yeah. And here's another question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, um, I actually have two questions. One quick one. Is there a proxy for the biodiversity of fungal uh, networks, uh, for instance, plants? And then uh, you mentioned 400 million years of evolution. So what's the strategy of plants to f defend them against uh, fungi? Ha. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good question. Uh, the first one, no, we want to have a, a proxy for biodiversity. So it, it's there's some work on and looking at total soil biodiversity and, and diversity of plants above ground to see are there mismatches, for example? Do you always find high soil biodiversity associated with high above ground biodiversity? Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a big mismatch between high diversity above ground and below ground. So it's not, there's not a good proxy yet. Um, people are developing tools where you can use satellite imagery to make predictions about what type of fungal network you'd find, right? So there's arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, and there's ectomycorrhizae, and ones that associate with orchids. Um, and there's some tools that you can use satellite imagery to sort of guess, you know, not guess, but predict uh, which, which type of, um, of network is associated at that level, but it's so coarse. It's really, really coarse. So I think that's a big, a big open area, yeah. Oh, and the, what was the second question again? It was, um, yes, right. I know, but defense. Okay, so people don't know this, but actually plants survive. The fungal networks on plants are the ancestral state. And plants evolved for tens of millions of years with no root systems and only associating with fungal networks, right? Like roots are kind of new <laughs> in evolutionary, not new, but you know, they survived for tens of millions of years with just fungal networks. Um, but yeah, we have an interesting paper out now that, that, that Justin was on as well, looking at that. How do plants now that, you know, these fungi are really good at getting carbon, how do they protect themselves against fungi? They're clever too. They've got all the different kinds of strategies. But what, what we've been focusing on is the site of nutrient transfer, these arbuscules, right, which are so beautiful. They look like little mini trees inside a cell. Um, but that's where the interesting dynamics of the carbon to phosphorus take place. Um, but just to add to that, it's not the only benefit of these networks, so it's really hard to sort of study, you know, cheating in these systems of like, you know, who takes more, because a fungal network, it might not be providing lots of phosphorus, but it may be protecting the plant against, you know, um, uh, herbivores. It can change its secondary compounds. It can help, you know, protect it against heavy metals. There's so many different benefits that studying that tit for tat kind of like, yeah, it's, it's quite difficult in the, in the lab. Yeah. Okay, but you uh, do amazing things in the lab. Eh? It's, uh, it's yeah. really, really exciting. Yeah. And then you're only studying one species of fungus and one plant. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> if we could just get a little yeah, bit Yeah, because bigger. there's a lot of interaction between fungi and everything, I think, as exactly, well. Exactly, exactly. So the, I think the, the sort of the coolest sort of adding complexity to this, to this layer is studying how bacteria, for example, use the network to travel between plants. Yeah. So you can add all of these different layers of complexity, yeah. um, but, but we're shy about doing that. We've got this one system that we just keep tweaking. No, very, and, very uh, clever. We'll very good. Happens, and yeah. it also brought me back to my time when I lived in Costa Rica, because the traveling wave is exactly what the army ants do. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's They're exactly the same. Yeah. So they explore the new part and yeah. then they resolve all the networks behind, behind it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have a look oh, at I'm it. Nigel look Frank's it papers, uh, late 80s. I'm yeah. look it up. Exactly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much.